Hey, uh, my name is Xue Ting. I'm from Singapore. Thank you for joining us this evening in uh, this session uh, on the contemporary role of pharmacists as cardiovascular team members. Right here with us today, uh, we have Professor Craig Beavers from the United States. We have Dr. Sotris Antonio from, uh, uh, from London. And uh, the three of us will be speaking on the perspectives of pharmacists, uh, the, uh, the, the perspectives uh, from, uh, from, the, from Asia, US and UK respectively. And later on in the panel discussion, we have Dr. Ong Hien Yi, Dr. Camilla Wong and Dr. Sahimi. Some disclosure, the content of this webinar is copyrighted by ISCP and should not be distributed without the prior permission of the ISCP. The views and opinions expressed in the webinar are those of the faculty members and do not necessarily represent those of the ISCP. The session will be live streamed via WANDA and ISCP and ASCP Facebook and YouTube pages. The European Board of Accreditation in Cardiology grants CME points for attendees who attend the full session and you will receive your certificate of attendance upon completing a survey sent via email after the webinar. Please use the live Q&A box on your right hand side if you have any questions. Um, we will try to answer all your questions, but if your answers are not, uh, your questions are not answered due to time constraint, you may email your question to the uh, email address stated on the slide. Okay, so um, the first talk would be by myself. I'm a senior clinical pharmacist in, from Kutikpat Hospital in, uh, in Singapore. The title of my talk is CB Team Pharmacist seen but not heard the Asian perspective. Thank you everyone for tuning in. We are very excited today as we have many participants from all over the world to join us. My name is Xue Ting, Senior Clinical Pharmacist in Singapore. Today we have the honour of inviting Assistant Prof Craig Beavers from the United States and Mr. Sotris Antonio from the United Kingdom. Today we will be discussing the roles of clinical pharmacies in the cardiology team. This is the outline of today's presentation. I will be presenting on the Asian perspective. Prof Beavers will be presenting on the American perspective and Mr. Antonio will be presenting on the European perspective. We will be using a commonly encountered clinical case to illustrate the roles of pharmacists and how they differ in different parts of the world. For my section on Asian perspective, we will be covering the roles of pharmacists in Singapore, Malaysia, as well as Japan. At the end of our presentations, we will discuss the opportunities of collaboration internationally to demonstrate the values of clinical pharmacists. Without further ado, we'll start with the Asian perspective, where cardiology pharmacists are seen but not heard. Let's first take a look at our case. Mr. KYH is a 59-year-old gentleman. His past medical history is significant for epilepsy. He presented with central crushing chest pain and was conveyed to the hospital via the EMS. In the ED, the ECG showed that there were ST elevations in the anterior leads. In the ED, the roles of pharmacists are typically quite limited. Here, I wish to highlight a couple of differences in the practice in these three countries, where it will provide the context to the discussion later on. Singapore is a very small country, hence all the hospitals are equipped with the catheterization lab. Aspirin will be loaded by the EMS depending on the ECG and route to the hospital, and when the patient arrives at the hospital, he will be loaded with ticagrelor. In Malaysia and Japan, where the country is a lot bigger, patients may, be, may need to be thrombolyzed first if the healthcare facility does not have a cath lab. Aspirin may or may not be loaded prior to the hospital arrival, and clopidogrel is more commonly used than ticagrelor. In the cath lab, 
the patient underwent successful percutaneous intervention to the proximal LED. During the procedure, BP needed to be supported by noradrenaline infusion transiently. If heavy thrombus load is noted in the cath lab, in Singapore and in Malaysia, IV antiplatelet may be started. In Japan, the use of additional antithrombotics is generally avoided. As for the duration of uh, dual antiplatelet therapy, we follow the ACCAHA or the ESC guidelines. In Japan, the use of the antithrombotics is guided by the guidelines that is endorsed by the Japanese Circulation Society. It is recommended to stratify the patient's risk and to tailor the duration of the therapy accordingly. The patient is transferred to the CCU where the CCU team takes over the care of the patient and orders up relevant medications. The team pharmacist plays a more prominent role here. The pharmacist conducts medication reconciliation by conducting patient interview and by reconciliation against the National Electronic Healthcare Record. This is an electronic platform that is shared across institutions nationwide. In Malaysia, Medication reconciliation is done against the hospital inventory system if the patient had been seen in the same institution before. Otherwise, the pharmacist will call up the clinics where the patient had been seen before to find out the medication history. And at the same time, the pharmacist will administer a questionnaire to ascertain the patient's adherence and perception to medications. In Japan, this is done via patient interview and reconciliation against the national insurance system. So this is what we have found out based on our medication reconciliation. Prior to the admission, the patient was taking phenytoin. He was not taking any herbal supplements and he is adherent to the therapy. On the clipboard on the right side, you can see the medications that is ordered up for the patient. The patient is on aspirin 100 milligrams every morning Ticagrelor, atobastatin, bisoprolol, and phenytoin. Common through all three countries, the pharmacist conducts medication review. The pharmacist also identifies drug-drug interaction. In this case, the drug interaction is between phenytoin and ticagrelor. Phenytoin is a strong CYP3A4 inducer and it might reduce the efficacy of ticagrelor. The pharmacist also monitors the clinical status as well as the vitals of the patient and looks out for opportunities to increase the beta blocker or add-on ACE inhibitors as appropriate. In Singapore, the pharmacist might recommend and interpret the CYP2C19 genotype and this will help the team in the selection of P2Y12 inhibitor. In Malaysia, platelet reactivity might be done. And in Japan, the use of genotyping is typically limited to research. On day 3 of patient's anterior STEMI, the patient's care has been stepped down. In Singapore and in Japan, the patient will be transferred to a general ward, whereas in Malaysia, the patient will be transferred to a cardiac rehabilitation ward. In Singapore and in Malaysia, the, patient, the inpatient pharmacist will join the ward rounds and provide recommendations to optimize the patient's risk factors. In all three countries, the pharmacists also provide patient education and also take part in the cardiac rehabilitation. A TEE is ordered and the patient was found to have an EF of 40%. An LV thrombus was also noted. The patient was then started on anticoagulation. In Singapore, the patient will be referred to the inpatient anticoagulation pharmacist, the IPAC pharmacist. This is a specialized clinical service for all patients who need warfarin. The pharmacist will review and provide recommendation on doses as well as outpatient follow-up plans. In Malaysia, depending on the institution, the ward pharmacist or the IPAC pharmacist may manage the anticoagulation. In Japan, the anticoagulation is generally managed by the doctors and will only refer to the pharmacist when required, for instance, where there is significant drug interactions. Nonetheless, in all three countries, the pharmacist will provide warfarin education to all patients who are started on warfarin. 
Finally, on day 5 of the patient's STEMI, the patient's INR is 2.3 and he is ready for discharge. The pharmacist will, perform, will provide specialized counseling on other new STEMI related medications, and in Singapore, sometimes this specialized counseling may be opportunistic. The pharmacist will also have to perform operational duties that includes the verification of discharge orders, preparation of the physical medications, as well as dispensing and counseling. And these duties are sometimes supported by the technicians as well. For the outpatient visits, the pharmacist will be seeing the cardiologist in three to four months. In the meantime, the patient may see the pharmacist for titration of warfarin or other medications. In Singapore, our pharmacist run clinics include the cardiology pharmacist clinic and the anticoagulation clinic. In the cardiology pharmacist clinic, the pharmacist is responsible for switching of antiplatelets if required, and that is done after discussion with the cardiologist or interventionist. The pharmacist will also monitor the INR and titrate uh, medications including warfarin, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, MRAs, or ARNIs according to the patient's BP and symptoms. The pharmacist will also manage the patient's risk factors to prevent uh, another cardiac event. In Malaysia, the INR clinic is co-run with the doctors, while in Japan, there is no pharmacist in the clinics. In all three countries, the pharmacist may be involved in the cardiac rehabilitation program to provide medication education in the outpatient setting. After going through the patient's journey, I hope you agree with me that gone are the days where pharmacists stand behind the counter dishing out bags of medications. We have seen several roles that clinical pharmacists play. Firstly, clinical pharmacists are experts in pharmacotherapy and medication management. They are also the safety net of medication prescribing, the advocates of cost-effective use of medications, as well as educators of medication use. And they are educators not only to the patients, but as well as to other healthcare professionals. Clinical pharmacists are valuable team members. Of course, all of us hope that clinical pharmacists can do even more especially in providing clinical services to fill the gaps in the care of the patient. These gaps can be unique to each healthcare system or healthcare model. So what are the challenges that are stopping us from doing just that? Firstly, manpower. Even though we try to evolve to take on more clinical roles, we are still largely bound by operational duties, including the actual packing and checking of the physical medications. There is also a lack of trained personnel. There is a lack of interest in the clinical track amongst the new pharmacists. As a result, there are fewer clinical pharmacists that can eventually run the clinical services. Next, the most practical consideration for most is the lack of funding. Many pharmacy services are somewhat free as we are unable to bill. For instance, when a pharmacist spends time and effort on patient education, this amount of time and effort is not chargeable. Going on a long training also impedes the promotion opportunities of pharmacists that went through residency, and therefore the remuneration becomes unattractive. Last, but definitely not the least, is the lack of recognition. That is because it is difficult to demonstrate value of clinical pharmacists. How do we show that what we do is valuable? And how do we show that we are doing a good job? And how do we actually quantify the harm that is avoided when we switch ticagrelor to another P2Y12 inhibitor when the patient is on phenytoin at the same time? When the administrators and the public cannot relate to this, Naturally, there is less recognition for clinical pharmacists. In my final slide, I wish to compare and contrast how healthcare services are charged in Singapore, Malaysia and Japan. In Singapore, the specialized services and clinics are charged according to the number of visits or reviews. As for the medications, profits generated from the medications are routed to the prescribing discipline 
and only the cost price of the medications goes back to the pharmacy. To the administrator, it probably looks like the pharmacy does not do very well and thus this reduces the recognition for pharmacy services even further. Pharmacies in Malaysia are funded by the government. Patients less than 60 years old, they pay only about 1 USD to see the doctor and medications are free. As for patients that are 60 years and above, everything is free. In Japan, pharmacists in the national hospitals are funded by the government and pharmacists may charge a flat fee for counselling during the dispensing of the medications. Having gone through the discussion, how do we actually move forward? I have initially thought about a long list of things I wish to do. However, I think the most important thing we have to achieve right now is to demonstrate value. We have to figure out a way to measure our value and have it easily understandable by the public and the administrators. I would like to thank Dr. Sahimi, Ms. Wong Yiching, as well as Professor Bando for sharing their experiences in their respective countries. Now you have heard the Asian perspective, Let's change gears to hear the American as well as the European perspective. Alright, so that was the Asian perspective. Next up, we have Professor Craig Beavers. He's the chairperson of the American College of Cardiology Cardiovascular Team. Uh, from the United States. He will share with us the experience in America. The title of his talk would be CV Team Pharmacist, Seen, Heard, and What's Next? The American Perspective. Dr. Uh, Prof. Beavers, please. Hello, my name is Craig Beavers. I'm a cardiovascular clinical pharmacist with the University of Kentucky College of Pharmacy in the ACC, the American College of Cardiology, Cardiovascular Team Section Chair. I'm going to talk to you about the contemporary role of pharmacists as CV members of the cardiovascular team, the USA perspective. Just to highlight, here is the education training of cardiovascular clinical pharmacists in the United States. Clearly, we complete a doctor of pharmacy degree, a four-year program, and we can do a PGY-1 postgraduate year one residency and or follow up with an ambulatory care cardiology residency or research fellowship. And key to this is board certification and multidisciplinary credentialing. The cardiovascular clinical pharmacists can have three major buckets of roles. They can be patient specific on the facility level, you know, including the items that is listed here in education, interaction, screening, pharmacotherapy management, facility specific regarding protocol, guideline, policy development, or review, research, core measures, quality activities, formulary management, and med safety, and then global services, including government and societal committees and agencies, uh, policy development, and public health initiatives. Case we've seen is a 59 year old male or a 59 year old person whose past medical history is significant of epilepsy, presented with central crushing chest pain, and conveyed to the hospital via EMS. EG at the emergency department, so ST uh, elevations and interior leads. Obviously, the activation of the cath lab can occur in the EMS or uh, upon arrival. The goal is to get the door to balloon time in 90 minutes, which everyone should be familiar with, or the transfer to one facility to another in 120 minutes. If you can't achieve those, you do the lytics in 30 minutes or less. We would do aspirin loaded upon arrival or an EMS with chewing the 81 milligrams, four of tablets, or rectal administration of MPL. And then in certain situations, you can do crush tachyglulor uh, or consider cangular a 2B3 inhibitor bolus uh, if you have concern about GI motility or shock. And then a lot of places in the United States still defer to giving a PCI with prosecutorial tachyglulor. And so where and, and how can the pharmacist have an impact? If you look at the global impact of a PCI versus a non-PCI hospital, you can see where fibrolytics are at play or primary PCI, and then overall the stratification in the care. And clearly by the orange uh, mortar and pedestal, pharmacists can have an impact on all these in terms of ad selection, policy and processes, and the ability to make clinical decisions. So just highlighting again with the uh, STEMI with the PCI going from the ED to the, the cath lab, uh, you know, again, talking about that uh, aspirin selection, if not received, then how to administer, um, reloading if that is an option for 
of the inhibitor and discussing the risk benefits for of that new coagulation selection and the inhibitor selection or use of newer. And then obviously assisting with the proper dose of medications, administration and assistance, uh, medication retrieval and here in the lab, the patients get a PCI to the LED and the procedure uh, blood pressure is supported by NORAD infusion transiently. Cath lab, for example, you know, the pharmacist could have worked on policies and processes around when to do 2B3 inhibitor and boluses, obviously if there's a common load. The anticoagulation, which can be started in the ED if it's an NSEMI or the boluses provided in the case would be assessed and monitored by the pharmacist. And then they could even do post-procedures safety and advocacy in that. And then bivalve use is still in some facilities. And then obviously the important discussion around DAP therapy really integrated in that discussion. And then of course we have all the roles of a pharmacist in the MI care quality, and that's the medication history and reconciliation uh, arrival or after the procedure, assisting and assuring that we meet quality measures uh, in the United States, uh, participating in disciplinary rounds and discharge and transitions of care. Uh, the patient goes to the CCU to take over the care and orders up relevant medications. Again, the meta history and reconciliation, you know, patient interview. We have no national health record in the United States, so we often follow the marquee process for the most optimal medication history. That's two sources that verify the same information, and that's how we work through with marquee. And participation in the ward rounds, and in the United States, we have great data that shows the 60 cent percent adverse events, identification of medication errors, uh, helping with quality metrics, and then lower mortality rates and fewer bleeding events in our MI patient population when a pharmacist is involved. An American Heart Association scientific statement talking about critical care technology highlights the need of pharmacists, and that's what's highlighted in the text, talking about the benefit on um, mortality, adverse drug events of having the pharmacist in the CCU. So the history show the phenytoin uh, on treatment and some herbal supplements. Patient is adherent, and you can see the medications that they're on, the phenytoin, the ticagrelor, the torvastatin, so the pharmacist would conduct that medication review, identify the drug-drug interactions like the phenytoin interaction, monitor for clinical status and titrate therapy, recommend platelet reactivity given the interaction. That's a good um, opportunity for the pharmacist to be engaged in and educate and really support. Uh, and genotyping, if able, or in some places they do that, it's mostly research-based in the United States, but some limited uptake in some Patients transfer the war on day three for the STEMI. Uh, in the United States, generally the board patients happen about 24 hours if they're stable enough. The pharmacist would continue on ward rounds, optimize that risk factor control from a secondary prevention or begin that process. Begin patient education, we do that at the beginning upon admission all the way through the encounter and then begin the outpatient and inpatient rehabilitation. And then, so working on those discharge activities, education, patient assistance programs, helping them get enrolled in those given that our, we have often to deal with the United States uh, prior authorization, and, and if they can't afford it, supplying coupons, communications of the plan of care to other providers, and post-discharge. We often follow the best practices for discharge back method in, in doing this all through the process of the admission. So we have that anthoracic echogram ordered, uh, showing 40% LV thrombus also noted on the echo. So in this particular instance, the pharmacist would be heavily engaged in providing recommendations of antithrombotic therapy, given that pharmacist is one of those areas that has limited data. The ward pharmacist or a pharmacist that's dedicated to anticoagulation stewardship would be involved in this discussion. Typically, it's the ward pharmacist, but if there are other compelling risk factors or issues, the anticoagulation stewardship pharmacist might be engaged. And of course, the ward pharmacist would provide that education. A5 of the STEMI, they must have chose warfarin, INRS 2.3, and patients ready for discharge. Again, providing that education on all the STEMI-related medications, verification of discharge orders, preparation of the medications, and dispensing and counseling. In the United States, we use a meds-to-beds process for a lot of our facilities to help facilitate these activities. Know the benefits of all of this and the activities in the pharmacies being engaged, uh, reducing meta-related readmissions, preventable adverse drug events, few discrepancies, and improved adherence and understanding. The outpatient visit at one month, the cardiology pharmacist uh, is seeing the patient usually in the, the first two to four weeks or calling the patient within 24 or 48 hours. Uh, and 
our situation, we have a pharmacist-run cardiology clinic that's a transition to care clinic that the patient's seen within the first seven days. We call it the CATS Pledge Program in Kentucky, and essentially we give that education upon uh, the inpatient side or in the CATH area. We give them 30 days of their free core medications. You can see those listed there. We provide them an appointment at hand at discharge. We do the consultation and education, and then we have them access to an RN 24-7 uh, we do a two-day follow-up phone call and then they follow up within seven days with us and then within 30 days with their physician. The big thing that is a challenge in the United States and we probably have similar challenges is manpower and, and especially in our rural areas around you know still having to do operational duties and not being able to devote to clinical activities. The lack of billing opportunities in the United States is, is a big challenge and given that we're a fee-for-service system and then hopefully as we evolve the value-based health care that might be enticing for us and help those and, and make sure that pharmacists are continually included. And then obviously the lack of, lack of recognition and the difficulty in showing the value. And we have great data that shows that, but really tying that back to the billing and reimbursement. Thank you for your time and I'm excited to discuss with the panel today. Thank you very much, Prof Be Beavers. Okay, um, so now we'll move on to the next section. Okay, next up we have uh, Dr. Sotris Antonio. He's the Executive Director of the Commonwealth Pharmacists Association in the United Kingdom. His, um, the title of his talk would, also, would be CV Team Pharmacists, Seen, Heard and What Next? The European Perspective. Dr. Antonio, please. Welcome everyone. My name is Soteris Antonio. I am Head of Pharmacy at St. Bartholomew's Hospital and a consultant pharmacist for cardiovascular medicine and also a board member of the ILA Professionals at the European Society of Cardiology. And I'm here to give you the UK perspective and also touch on a bit about the European perspective. So we have our case. He's a 59-year-old gentleman that others have presented with a past medical history of epilepsy and been admitted for central crushing chest pain. And similar to the US, for somebody coming in with an admission, they go straight to a center that has the primary PCI facilities, which is 24 seven, i.e. bypassing the local closer hospitals often to have that intervention. And we have the same metrics where with a call to balloon time, so a call, phone call to open up the artery, within 90 minutes or a door to balloon time within 60 minutes. Now in the emergency department or in our case, the local ambulance service, we would have had the patient would have received 300 milligrams of aspirin, but also with clopidogrel 600 milligrams. Potentially at the emergency department, if a patient went to an emergency department and then got transferred to a PCI center, they may well have received ticagrelor. 180 milligrams as a lady lifts. So in the cath lab, in view of the heavy thrombus load, eptifibotide bolus was started. We would have initiated dual antiplatelet therapy and then complete eptifibotide infusion within CCU, but no more than six hours of the infusion because of the potent antiplatelet effects having effects within six hours thereafter. A bit about Bart's Heart Center. We are the largest cardiovascular unit in the UK. And you can see here, there's 10 cath labs and 10 theatres, 250 general cardiovascular beds and 54 critical care beds. We serve a population of 5 million with around 6,500 acute admissions per year. The key relevant here is that there's been a lot of NHS concerns around mortality being increased if you got admitted over the weekend. And so there was a clear, clear case for expansion to seven day service. Now, from a heart attack perspective, you can see that patients often don't think about the office hours and are willing to be admitted on a Saturday and a Sunday and also outside of traditional office working hours. And you can see we've got a substantial number of patients being admitted after six o'clock and before midnight. Now, if you relate that for pharmacy, we've got medicines optimization, national guidance, that talks around the safe and effective use of medicines to enable the best possible outcomes. And you can see here regards to medicines reconciliation, 
they would like us to carry out medicines or conciliation within 24 hours or sooner if clinically necessary when the person moves from one care setting to another, for example, if they've been admitted to hospital. So we were fortunate enough as part of this merger developing the Barts Heart Centre and recognising the NHS want of a seven day service, we submitted a business case to suggest that we will provide a seven day service meeting the needs of medicines reconciliation within 24 hours. Now, this patient's been in the CCU, and like the other countries, a pharmacist or a pharmacy technician conducts medicines reconciliation, and we also have a national electronic healthcare record system through the patient interview. And similar to the US, all of our patients will automatically receive a total stat of 80, and then consideration to reduce down to 40, based on other risk factors for risk of myopathy, for example. And then Ticagalor phenytoin, we've already identified as an interaction, and that's what the role of the pharmacist, but we do not routinely undertake genotyping, and so we don't recommend potential alternatives based on genotyping. However, we do recommend alternatives based on the individual risk factors. And this is because we have to remember that all clinical trials have an inclusion criteria and an exclusion criteria. And this is an example from one of the papers from Plato or Triton Timmy. You can see there are bleeding risk exclusion criteria, but actually we don't routinely implement that in practice. And hopefully after our discussion, there'll be someone will challenge me on that. And bleeding is really important. All registry data highlights that if you experience a major bleed in hospital, it has a dramatic adverse event on mortality within the next 30 days. And you can see a tenfold increase in the risk of mortality. So locally, we applied a risk scoring to guide antiplatelet therapy, as and we're already aware that people use risk scoring to guide as to whether somebody should be seen sooner for a PCI, as an example, and we're guiding it to guide antiplatelet therapy. We did use Grace and Crusade, but now we just focus on the Crusade, which is a risk scoring to identify how high the risk of major bleeding is. And if they're at high risk of major bleeding, we will give them clopidogrel as opposed to ticagrelor. The other thing I'd like to point out is the author is myself, but everyone else, there's a couple of other pharmacists and all the others are consultant physicians. So there's something here about raising our profile and working as an MDT will make an increase the profile of pharmacy. What do our findings show? Well, if you apply a risk score you can see that you have a lower incidence of major adverse cardiovascular events. What about if we compare clopidogrel for those patients who are at high risk of bleeding, getting receiving clopidogrel in comparison to ticagrelor, there is no difference in their outcomes for these patients. So that's really, really important. If we look at those details, significant, you can see that risk scoring with a MACE versus all-cause mortality dramatically reduced statistically significant, also with stroke, recurrent MIs and stent thrombosis with no difference in the risk of major bleeding. That gives you that net overall clinical benefit that you tend to see now in clinical trials. The other thing to consider is our length of stay and as time progresses, our length of stay reduces and reduces and in particular due to the pandemic, we've been very clear to try and get patients out of hospital where possible. So whereas most people think about transferring to general ward, most of ours will be discharged from that same ward, but it is important that we would optimize their risk factors. And how do we do this? Well, we would follow them up as part of the virtual consultation as a follow-up clinic. So we see our patients at two, eight, and 12 weeks, and that's an opportunity for the pharmacist to then up titrate and optimize their secondary prevention. However, with this individual, they've also got an LV thrombus and due to a low ejection fraction. And what I've added here is starting anticoagulation that may be either with a NOAC or with a vitamin K antagonist. Now, I appreciate NOACs and LV thrombus are off-label, but not everyone will be suitable for a VKA. And in particular, these patients will be on triple therapy. And I think we'll all agree that they'll be on the clopidogrel as opposed to the more potent antiplatelets. But the key point here, if we know that NOACs show reduction of intracranial hemorrhage in comparison to warfarin, why would we risk that with triple therapy, which would dramatically increase the risk of intracranial hemorrhage? 
So we evaluated this looking at the novel or anticoagulants in comparison to vitamin K antagonists, looking at patients with an LV thrombus after an acute MI. Again, that multidisciplinary working and raising the profile of pharmacy as part of a joint initiative. What did our findings show? Well, you may be surprised to see that at six months, there was a greater resolution if you're on the NOAC, and that was maintained at 12, 18, and 24 months. And in terms of systemic thromboembolic events, you can see there was a greater incidence of strokes with warfarin in comparison to NOAX, and a greater incidence of bleeding with warfarin there with NOAX. And perhaps that's not surprising, because we know it takes an average of approximately at least six weeks for people to get stabilized in warfarin. And during that period, you'll have an INR above three or an INR below two, which increases their risk of strokes or increases their risk of major bleeding. What is clear is that education is critical and recognising the length of stay has been reduced. We have provided patient consultation videos that we give all of our patients links to run by our pharmacy department. And that is clear to support patients post discharge as well as the ongoing virtual consultations. How are we remunerated? Well, we are not remunerated anything specifically. This is, we are within the infrastructure of a hospital. And so it's really down to us to demonstrate our value and raising our profile. So clear things that we've initiated, maybe around cost-effective prescribing, saving some money off the drug budget. And where complex, we might want to invest in pharmacy to save their financial benefit on the drug expenditure. So in summary, think about some of the key enablers, whatever's on the agenda, that might be an opportunity to raise the profile of pharmacy, as in particular around the value to patients. Think about potential financial expenditure and invest to save. We may also take on initiatives that we think will be of value within our standard staffing, and then once established, threaten to take that away unless it's been funded, which is also an effective process to get pharmacy staff on board and invested. We do have metrics such as medicines reconciliation as a way of holding the hospital to account as well as our patients to ensure that they are remunerated appropriately to invest into pharmacy services. So by having a seven day, we're able to manage medicines reconciliation, there's less omitted critical medicines, as well as patient input. If you look at the staff surveys from patients, one of the things that we always complain about is having to wait a long time for the medicines at discharge. So clearly the challenge is how do we demonstrate and increase our workforce, and we should think about the right role for the right person. And what I mean here about the value and the role for pharmacy technicians who are registered in the UK and getting those posts funded, as well as ensuring that you work closely with your MDT colleagues and in particular your consultant physicians. And that's really because if you can get them to raise the profile of pharmacy, you've almost got your job done. And on that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Prof Beavers and Dr. Antonio about the, uh, on your insightful talks. Actually, I really liked the part where uh, Dr. Antonio actually said that um, that we should take on initiatives and then threaten to take it away. I think that would be very effective for, on the uh, administrators. <laughs> okay, so uh, right now we are going to proceed to our uh, panel discussion. Uh, we have Dr. Ong Hien Yi with us. Dr. Ong Hien Yi is a cardiologist uh, and he's also the president of the Singapore Cardiac Society. We also have Dr. Camilla Wong. Dr. Camilla Wong is the uh, chief pharmacist of Singapore and uh, she's also the deputy director of Allied Health Division in SG, Singapore General Hospital. And uh, last but not least, we have Dr. Sahibi from Malaysia. She was previously um, working at Tengku Ampuan Af Afzan Hospital as head of clinical unit. But uh, right now, she's been recently promoted. And congratulations to her. She's now uh, working in the Ministry of Health in Malaysia. And uh, she is the subject matter expert of anticoagulation. And at the same time, she's also working at the Sedang Hospital, which is one of the uh, cardiology center and also the head of clinical unit. So um, 
let's uh, take a look at the questions that have been uh, that have come in to from the Q and A section. So maybe I will start with uh, this question that is posted to Prof Craig and Dr. Sotris. Um, how should the day-to-day -day pharmacists start doing all the studies, write papers, and the recommendations which you both were involved? Um, this, what how, um, may I just add some of my own uh, questions into the in, uh, uh, to add on to this question? So, is there any uh, minimum training or some uh, uh, who do we start working with to help us uh, get there? So, Terrence, I'll let you go first, and then I'll I'll, I'll add on. Thanks. Thanks, you, Ting. Uh, many thanks for the questions and invitation. I think we shouldn't be afraid to start small. So, whilst we've demonstrated some publications and presented some publications, I think what will always be of value to our multidisciplinary team is feedback on prescribing or audits to review how well we're doing in order to improve our services. How well are we preparing the care or providing the care to our patients? So don't be afraid to start small and we've all started small and then feeding back on audits and in particular where possible make those audits multidisciplinary because then you get buy-in from everyone and you'll seem to be more integral in particular around the prescribing. I think as that develops there may be an opportunity to evaluate your clinical practice. So many of our publications is an idea of evaluating our practice that we've published our data. So the key messages from my perspective is, I think as pharmacists go around and reviewing their patients, they may identify some potential improvements. Don't be afraid to assess that, get that baseline, and then the standard quality improvement initiatives around how we can improve that. And then if it's good enough, there's a potential interest outside of your own hospital. There's always the interest of other pharmacists to um, hear about that or learn about that, either conference presentations or the full publications. In terms of that support, not everyone's gonna have a PhD, but again, by working with our multidisciplinary colleagues, there's an opportunity to get some academic input from either academics or clinical academics, if you feel that you haven't got the skills to publish. So it's really starting from the basics, gently building up, and then suddenly you'll have a, a big snowball effect of all the work and being more integral around ongoing audits and reviewing your practice. And I, I concur and echo that. I think it is starting small, looking at you know quality improvement projects that you can uh, kind of evaluate what your processes are and kind of look at unique things that you're doing that you could share with the community that, um, impact the care of patients and going from there. I think finding good mentorship is key as well. So, you know, seeking out people who have been doing this and then to add on to what Soteris was saying, if you look at, you know, your professional organizations and networking through those, both, you know, locally, regionally, and internationally, you know, I think there are a lot of great questions we can address. It's really coming up with the numbers sometimes to, to make it meaningful. Um, and, and, and being willing to be patient, you know, it takes time to, to get there. And, and, and just if you're willing to work at it and look at it and, and take a little bit of time to do those things, then, then most certainly it's a value. Thank you both. Um, yeah, I guess for, for us, we would have to start working with um, multidisciplinary teams and to, to get more numbers uh, together. And move on. Okay, so uh, I'd like to um, pose the next question to Dr. Camilla Wong. So Dr. Camilla Wong, you are the chief pharmacist um, and I wish to find out from the ministry points of, uh, ministry's point of view, what do you think are the needs of our population right now? Yeah, th thanks you think. Um, Maybe, can I just make a, a quick correction? So I'm, I'm Chief Pharmacist of Singapore, but I'm also the Director for Allied Health at Sengkang General Hospital, uh, no longer at SGH, yeah. Um, this question, I guess, uh, I, I guess we first need to look at the demands. Uh, we have an aging population, right? Uh, our old age support ratio is, is, is coming down. You know, 10 years ago, it was one, you know, it's eight. Now we have four to every one senior. Uh, our consumption of healthcare per person has also been going up as well. 
right? Whether it's for admissions, uh, outpatient appointments, specialty outpatient appointments, polyclinic appointments, etc. Um, a top three polyclinic diagnosis is, uh, I don't know if you're aware, it's hyperlipidemia, hypertensive diseases, and diabetes. A top 10 admissions, four of which are cardiac you know, related, you know, uh, ischemic heart disease, other cardiac conditions, diabetes mellitus, and cerebral vascular disease. Um, coupled with all of this, we have precision medicine, right, in our midst. And, and I think most of you are very familiar with what that means. So what I feel we need to really do, a, a key need for our population is really to looking at empowering our population. One, to prevent, uh, if you ask me, uh, from getting sick uh, from mm -hmm. chronic conditions. Two is that when they fall sick um, with a chronic condition, uh, they must be able to manage their, their own conditions somewhat uh, because, you know, with, with minimal demands on the healthcare system, because we are very stretched in healthcare, in our healthcare system already. Yeah. Um, and, and the way we do this is that we empower and engage the patients in a very meaningful way. Um, and what do I mean by that? Uh, I, I think we have all heard about how, you know, the what matters most to you question that we need to start to engage patients with. Uh, the, you know, how, how do we do that through motivational interviews, right? Uh, where you strengthen that, you know, that personal motivation and a commitment to a specific goal, right? Um, this, this, was, this was not taught in school. We taught a lot of the clinical part, the knowledge and the skill set, but these are the, the, soft, the soft part of things. We're not taught. And, Actually, this plays a huge role in, in the management of patients with uh, cardiac conditions. Yeah. So Dr. Wong, do you think our pharmacists have, uh, in, uh, uh, we have enough number of pharmacists to fill this gap? Or, and do our pharmacists have enough of such skills to actually um, uh, perform this role? Yeah, so I, I do feel that our pharmacists are actually, the Singapore pharmacists are poised in a very good position to fill this need. Uh, when you talk about how skilled they are, actually many institutions have uh, their own in-house programs where they develop pharmacists um, to have the clinical knowledge and skill sets, at least up to uh, maybe a general clinical knowledge and skill set, right? Uh, we also have in place, uh, you know, uh, specialty programs, right? So for advanced clinical knowledge and skill set, uh, we have a register, right, for specialist pharmacists and we have residency programs and postgraduate programs to help you develop them. That's a longer route. But actually what's critical, if you ask me, is, is the advance. Yeah, we need those specialist pharmacists, but to develop the generalist practitioner uh, to a certain level, a minimum level of where they can help to really provide that support uh, to the healthcare system in the management of cardiac patients. Thank you, Dr. Wong. Okay, um, the next question, I would like to actually pose it to Dr. Ong. Um, Dr. Ong, I just wish to get your opinion uh, from physician's point of view. What do you think uh, doctors expect from the team pharmacies apart from the medication supply itself? Hi, thanks for having me on board. Um, I, I think we all recognize the role of pharmacies uh, helping us and of course, the most obvious role is helping us in, in the in the um, in acute setting in the wards as well. And if I have a dollar for every time someone saved me from my uh, prescribing mistakes, um, the main, the other main role will be uh, follow up. Um, I'm now in prior practice. I have a luxury of following up my patients uh, within a week or within a day if I want to. But I remember my previous role in in a Kutipot hospital, uh, we had serious problems seeing patients soon after their STEMI or NSTEMI. And we, I think I worked with Doreen and yourself to try to get an uh, a early review by a pharmacist um, within a week or two weeks after their acute STEMI to make sure they're taking the right medicines and make sure they're on the right track. So I think these are the main roles for, for the pharmacies that we should push for. And Singapore has, has a hybrid system of almost a socialist healthcare plus financial incentives, which is similar to the American system. Uh, but we're really more towards a socialist sort of new social healthcare system. And demonstrating uh, value or dollar value is, is always going to be tough, and we, we struggle to do that, if, if I'm correct.
Sorry. Um, okay, thank you, Dr. Ong. Right, okay. I would like to pose the next question then to uh, Dr. Sahimi. Dr. Sahimi, can I, uh, we are the subject matter expert in Malaysia, uh, and we are not familiar with the, uh, the, the model in Malaysia. Could you share with us uh, the model that was adopted in Malaysia? And, uh, and from your point of view, what do you think is needed to move pharmacy practice uh, forward in Malaysia? Okay, uh, thank you, Ziting, for having me here. Actually, um, our model is a mixed model. Uh, firstly, we want to follow US and Singapore. That's why we started with the BCPS. But when we discussed with the higher authority, they um, said that pharmacist is not included in government order as a specialist. So that we have to follow the model that's similar with the medical profession. That means pharmacists should be have um, um, PhD graduates or master in the for their professional, and then um, in the public government order also there there's um, in 1917 I think the public service department started the subject ma subject matter expert to recognize individual and in certain uh, skills uh, uh, to promote uh, them uh, to the higher authority. So we follow that model and then uh, so our journey is about 10 years. So uh, luckily this year we have uh, three uh, subject matter experts, one in anti-coagulation um, uh, medication therapy and then two uh, in uh, infectious disease. Uh, so I think um, as uh, to move away forward for the pharmacy to collaborate with the others um, healthcare provider, we have to train more pharmacy. So for the training for subject matter expert and then uh, in their field, and then this uh, actually the task of the subject matter expert needs to uh, train more pharmacists uh, to become a subject matter expert and then um, to be recognized as a team or partner as the uh, onset as, uh, to give a better serving for the patient. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Sahimi. Okay, um, I'm looking at the Q and A uh, question, uh, Q and A box. Uh, I have a question that I think is uh, for uh, Dr. Antonio. Uh, are pharmacists remunerated for virtual follow up consult after the patients are discharged from the bats from some bats, and what? Uh, what's the role of community pharmacies after they are discharged uh, in the UK? Yeah, very, very good question. So if I take the involvement of community pharmacists, as I've highlighted that the length of stay for people having heart attack is less than two days now. We're discharging patients the next day. So there's a big role that community pharmacists can play because we know that within the first 10 days, people are starting to make decisions to stop taking their medicines. And that may be for a variety of reasons, such as experiencing side effects, maybe having some practical difficulties. And that's where there's an opportunity for the community pharmacist to reiterate the importance of taking medicines and for patients to understand. And that's really because we could talk to patients blue in the face around their medicines whilst they've had a heart attack but really their ability to retain that information when they've just had a life-changing environment such as having a heart attack, perhaps that time to retain the information around the medicines is not the time whilst they're in hospital. So as a result of that, there's an opportunity for community pharmacists and we routinely refer our patients to community pharmacists as part of the discharge medication system where the community pharmacists can educate them. In terms of the virtual consultations, are we commissioned for those? Well, this is the example of us demonstrating a value for that before we ask for remuneration by our primary care colleagues because we are taking some of their responsibilities. And as a result of this work, we're starting to get that remuneration from primary care, say primary care physicians, because they're starting to see us optimizing the care of their patients for them. And as a result of that, they're starting to have some discussions to get in around that process of remunerating and we've just been successful in remunerating and improving our links with primary care as a result. 
Okay, thank you, Dr. Antonio. Um, okay, we have a couple more minutes. Um, I will ask one last question. Actually, it's my own question. So I would like to ask uh, Prof. Beavers and Dr. Antonio, uh, what do you think uh, are the specific uh, steps for pharmacists in Asia that we should take, like um, compared to uh, the the against the history of your own places of practice. You repeat the question again. Sorry. Ah, okay. So, um, what is the is what's your specific advice on what uh, the, the on the next steps that we should take uh, for pharmacists in Asia, uh, comparing. Uh, the against the history of uh, practice in your own country. I mean, I think, you know, and as we saw in the presentation, there's a lot of similarities. There's a lot of differences in, you know, training and ability of what the pharmacist can do and, and not do. I think for everybody, and especially in any area that wants to advance their model, um, I think part of it is working through the, the an area of, of demonstrated value of, of some aspect and, and getting yourself in, inserted. Uh, so showing a program, I think, for example, what uh, added value you can do in a transitions of care clinic from a heart failure or in my perspective, and then growing it out from, from that perspective is one avenue of doing that. Um, I think, again, the key is multidisciplinary, improving uh, of how you can add that additional layer of expertise by having, uh, you know, the pharmacotherapy expert uh, in that area. Um, and then the other aspects that are also of value, especially working with cardiology colleagues is, you know, cardiologists and, and our, our cardiology peers are, are obviously very in tune to a lot of the pharmacotherapy pieces, but how you layer in cardiovascular pharmacotherapy with other disease states and you think of the patient from, you know, a chronic management or as a holistic perspective, there's a lot of things that we know that we can tie and think about um, that, you know, can, can optimize their drug therapy regimen and routine. Um, and it's not just, you know, how do we get patients to hear things, but even thinking about, as we alluded in the conversation, you know, when is appropriate to do platelet function testing or pharmacogenomics. And that's not just, oh, we have someone on clopidogrel, but knowing, okay, they're on phenytoin or another agent that may uh, upregulate certain enzymatic activity that, you know, not all the, you know, our peers may not, our, our other uh, clinician peers on the team may not remember or be aware of, uh, of all those, you know, niches. And, and I always say a joke or an anecdote, my, our, our lead chief cardiologist at UK at one time when, before she left, she was like, my knowledge of cephalosporins, for example, ended at third generation cephalosporins, right? And so we often are confronted with patients that come in with heart failure and have, you know, superimposed pneumonia, and you're trying to optimize their antibiotic therapy, minimize sodium content, or, you know, so how you can really contribute to the team, so. If I'd come in briefly, just because I'm conscious of your time, but one thing I would say that is applicable for all pharmacists is around medication risk and medication safety. And within cardiovascular disease, there's a number of high risk medicines. And if you look at all the publications that lead to hospitalizations due to adverse drug reactions, you'll see common themed high risk medicines. Anticoagulants are always there. Warfarin, and I'm sure that will be the case with the DOACs. Non-steroidals is another classic one. ACE inhibitors, ARBs with acute kidney injuries. So there's a huge opportunity. So some of the things that I would be doing perhaps in Singapore, if I was in the position would be, how are we doing around the prescribing of DOACs? We know that there's some more publication, recent publications that we are inappropriately dosing our patients on the DOACs. And if it's too low, these patients are coming in with having acute strokes. If it's too high, they're coming in with major bleedings. And sometimes we're inappropriately reducing the dose because of the perception of reducing their risk of bleeding. But there are patient factors that are patient, put in a patient at risk of having a major bleed. So you may want to review the high risk medicines as a priority to start demonstrating how you can improve the prescribing of these, recognizing that a clear focus for a pharmacist 
should be around medication safety and how to improve the medication risk. So if there are registries, that would be a way of reviewing it and seeing what other people are doing to improve the prescribing and sharing some of that knowledge that will benefit all of our patients holistically. Yeah, uh, I agree with uh, Sotris and Great. So we should do more publication and then we should have a collaboration with the Asian uh, pharmacies, uh, especially in cardiovascular team uh, pharmacies. Thank you very much. I was about to also suggest international collaboration because I think um, with guidance from, from uh, Dr. Sotris and uh, Prof. Evers, I think we can uh, actually move forward together. And yeah, uh, sorry to keep all of you back. It's 9.03 p.m. 9.04 p.m. in Singapore. Uh, it's actually quite late for everybody. Everybody must be very tired from the whole day of uh, uh, conference. So I thank everybody for your time here. And uh, we'll see you at the conference tomorrow if you are uh, able to join us. Thank you very much. Um, take care and good night.